Welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Marketing Orthopedics, Balancing Priorities to Achieve ROI. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We encourage you to ask questions using your Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. Feel free to introduce yourselves to other attendees by posting comments to the chat feature. Be sure to use the all panelists and attendees so everyone gets to see your comments. This webinar is being recorded. Please know we'll share via email the video link to each attendee in the upcoming week. Today's distinguished panelists of orthopedic marketing leaders are Lynn Buscaran, owner, Peak Medical Marketing, Ron Persefsky, Solutions Consultant with Raider 8 and past president and former board member of AAOE. Matthew Johnson, Director of Marketing and Human Resources at Concord Orthopedics, and Jason Olenio, Vice President of Associated X-ray Imaging. So I turn to Ron to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Welcome everybody. Sorry for the confusion about the start time. Um, we, everybody on the panel thought that, the, the, that it started at one, so we apologize for that confusion. Uh, but we, I am so excited about this talk today. I know some of you came here today expecting to see uh, Lynn Pratt be on the panel. Um, she just had an urgent matter that she had to attend to. Um, so she's fine, um, but she, uh, she was not able to attend. So I just want to thank Lynn Buscarin uh, for joining uh, kind of at the last minute. So um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Lynn. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Ron. Mia, if you can stop your share, I'm going to go ahead and share um, some of the results of the survey that uh, a bunch of people participated in. Uh, so thank you to those folks who did participate in that. Um, uh, I just want to kind of run through some of those uh, results with everybody because it helps to kind of set the table for our conversation today. And it's basically talking about some of the priorities that we have in our marketing world. Um, so the first question had to do with, um, with Facebook. How important is Facebook to the marketing plan of your practice? And uh, so we had about 22 people respond to all these survey questions. So thanks to all of you. And you can see uh, Facebook is a pretty big priority in practices, and that seems like an appropriate place for people to be putting their attention. Um, well placed. Uh, Instagram, somewhat important for uh, about 41% of the practices, not very important for anybody. And it looks like um, Twitter followed a similar kind of path there. So it seems like in the social media world that we're uh, putting our attention in the right place, uh, being Facebook at the moment. Uh, how important are online reviews to your current marketing plan? Happy to see, especially where I come from, that uh, that's it's a really a top priority for a lot of practices. So that's that's really encouraging to see, um, and that's not. I'm glad nobody said that it was not important. So, <laughs> um, so local local team and sponsorships seem to be a pretty decent spread across the board. Um, most people leaning towards it being very important or somewhat important and about 40% uh, um, having it be a little bit less of a priority in the practice. Um, and then um, a question that's very important uh, about, you know, how much do you put into your marketing budget? Or like what percentage of your revenues? And the, I, I think the standard that I've been familiar with in terms of a benchmark has been about one to 3%. Uh, so the average for the respondents was 1.57, so basically 1.6%, but the range was from 0.5% all the way up to 10%, which, um, which I thought was really interesting. And then, you know, the, the last question uh, was kind of an open-ended question, uh, you know, kind of like what makes up the majority of your marketing plan, just give, give people an opportunity to, to um, to leave some comments in. I thought it was really interesting, um, you know, because there's a pretty wide range of, of activities here that, that people are participating in. Um, some of them are clearly marketing and some of them are, are sales. And that kind of leads me into the first question that I want to throw out to the panel. Um, I'm, I'm, and this may sound like a silly question, but it really isn't. It, it, 
in my book, it's not a silly question, but you know, what is marketing? Like, can I throw it to you first, Jason, and just say, you know, what is marketing? And, and, and is there a difference between marketing and sales? Sure, sure. I always, I always say that uh, marketing gets me in the door, then it's my job to sell. Okay. Marketing, marketing gets your patient to your practice. Then it's then it's your job to to keep them there, I guess. Okay, that's that's, that's I like that answer. How about you, Matt? What, what do you what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, for me, I think marketing is is starting to build the trust with your patient initially, um, in whatever medium or form that is. Mm -hmm. And after you earn that trust and you can build that trust, then you can do the sales thing inside of your building. Um, that's what you know your providers are very very good at. At least we hope they are. Um, but how do we get people through those doors to be able to experience that quote unquote sale at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Great, great. And, and, and Lynn, what, what, what are your thoughts on the difference? Uh, I'd like to follow kind of what Matthew said. Sure. That marketing is building a relationship with your patients, with your community, with your referral base. And it's, it's not really a sell. It's, it's really the patient experience. That's yeah. the difference of marketing and sales. Sales is that here's my widget. Will you buy it? <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm sure that resonates with a lot of, a lot of us on the, on, on the zoom today. Um, and it brings me to another question, which is kind of a philosophical question, but you know, when does a patient visit start? You know, when does the patient experience start? And um, I think it's an important question for us all to look at. Um, so I'm going to throw it back to you, Lynn. What, what, yeah. what, are, your, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, it's funny. We have talked about this before in the past. And the patient experience really starts when they are on their phone Googling your practice. Mm -hmm. What are they seeing? Are they seeing you've got five-star ratings? Are they seeing that they can click on your website right from the Google listing? And can they get on your website? And is your website updated? Is it modern? So that's truly the step before they walk through your door. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Matt, what do, you, what do you have to say about when a patient visit or experience actually starts with a practice? Sure. I'd actually like to take a little bit earlier than that. Um, <laughs> possible. Um, so something that we're trying to do at Conquer Orthopedics is to capture patients far before they even need to be with us. Um, and as we move through this, this little webinar, we'll talk about social media marketing and things like that. But um, if our long-term, long-build strategies to market our practice are effective, <laughs> which we all hope they are, um, then patients should understand exactly where they need to be going before they get injured, right? Like they've seen us in the community. They've seen our, our providers on some kind of a social media video or something. They've heard their voices. They've seen them in the community. So then the moment they get injured, it's not even necessarily a Google moment at that time. <laughs> For me, it's like, oh, my leg just broke. I need to go to Conquer Orthopedics right now and not even think about, oh, who, the, who is the best one around me? I should already be the best one in their minds um, before they even have that, that moment. So yes, obviously SEO and, and Google is super important, but if we can capture that mentality before you're even injured, that's the tough part. And mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll talk about some kind of sales cycle as well, but for, for orthopedics, as I think we all know, you're. There's no like, oh, it's weekend sale coming today, you know, <laughs> coming this weekend, 50% uh, <laughs> off knee replacements. Like that's a happen. great, <laughs> great weekend to sprain your ankle. <laughs> yeah, it looks, it looks pretty good outside. Um, so the, right. the sales cycle is so long. So if you can be in, in a top of mind all the time, that's so important for, for us yeah. and, and for marketing for us. That's great. Um, man, it sounds like what you're describing is really just building a brand for an organization. And, and mm -hmm. when I think about that, I, you know, I think about Jason in terms of brand building, because he's like, I've known this gentleman for maybe decades, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. You're yeah. not old enough, but, <laughs> but <laughs> now we're actually pretty close to the same age. You just look better than me. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, but, but but building a brand uh, for an organization is about building relationships. So sure. it, how do you see that working for an orthopedic practice? Uh, like you said, Ron, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and when I started, every orthopedic office was uh, Dr. Jones or Dr. Smith. It was just the the guy's practice. There was no logo. There was no marketing piece. And now everything's Excel Orthopedics and Copa, you, logos, logos. I mean, Nike and go, everybody's got a logo. It's it's really cool to see these orthopedic practices with logos and, and creative names and colors. And uh, it's awesome. It, it makes your your patients feel like part of a team. They want to, they want to, people want to wear the Nike logo. They want to wear your logo too. I think Matt was right on the money with, uh, you want your customers to know who you are before they need you. That's, that is, that is a very accurate thing. I think that's, um, that's a, a great point. I know that, um, you know, Lynn Pratt, who was going to be on the call today, one of the things that she talked about in terms of building a brand was building a sense of or of knowledge about the different providers in your practice in a community, sure. uh, kind of human, humanizing those providers. So I guess I would throw it out to to whoever has a great answer. You know, how do you humanize your providers in your practice so that they see them not only as physicians but as members of your community? Yeah, yeah. I think I can take a stab at this. For for us, the the first hurdle there is getting the providers to want to do it. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our providers, um, like when they come in, especially the new ones, or when I started here, it was, oh, have you ever been marketed before? And it's one of these like, uh, what's that now? And why would I ever do that? Like I work from this building and that's the thing that people should know. Um, but it's, it's building that trust with people. And I want our patients to have about three or four touch points with our providers before they even step foot through our door. I want them to hear their voice. I want them to see their faces. I want, the, I want our patients to see different publications or, or you know, webinars or things that they've done. So the moment they get in there, you don't have this, oh my God, there's a white coat, like hands off, whatever this person says goes. So we start building that trust and that relationship before you get in the door. And then once you meet that person, then you can start getting into, oh, like I saw on your profile, you like rock climbing. I'm, I love rock climbing. And you can build those things. And I can tell you when I hurt my shoulder, I will follow my surgeon, not concrete orthopedics, but <laughs> my surgeon to the ends of the earth because we, we bonded on something that was so much bigger than, oh, I'm gonna fix your shoulder. So one, getting your providers to want to do that and to be able to say, hey, like, yeah, we're very well trained. We're all very smart. And I think that's kind of like the baseline and the expectation of when you go into a practice um, and have the best doctors. Um, but what more can you offer me than just that fantastic care? Um, how do you connect with me on a, on a more personal level? So breaking down that barrier between the white coats and the normal people um, is super important for, for that brand and for the trust. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think that one, making a physician understand that they play an active role in it and understanding that there is a lot of um, loyalty that's developed towards the physician, not just the practice itself. So mm -hmm. uh, two, two great points. Jason, you had a great story that you had told me about practices uh, promoting physicians in creative ways. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know if there was some special type of card or something that the doctors were yeah. handing out. They made um, one of my ortho customers created, and this was a great idea. I don't know where they got it from, but they created what looked like a baseball card. So instead of a doctor handing out a business card, which, which we see a million of them, it was a baseball card with the doctor in his lab coat with the, he had a golf club or a fishing pole or, uh, or a baseball bat, whatever his thing was. And on the front, it was just a picture and, you know, like a baseball card. And when you flipped it over on the back, it was where he went to school, um, where he did his residency fellowship, uh, other places he's worked, his specialties. And then a little bit about uh, married kids, um, uh, personal activities, uh, baseball fan, hockey fan, you know, whatever, just something that, that 
made the patient feel like they knew this person. Like I went to see Dr. So-and-so and he gave me his card and, and, and I know, you know, it, I don't know where if it goes on the refrigerator or where it goes, but it makes them feel like they have a personal relationship with this guy or girl or, or whoever. And, uh, I also think that news travels to the family and the friends and, and so on and so forth. You know, it's, it's just a nice thing to have. We should all have our own baseball cards. We should. We should. We should. <laughs> Imagine yeah. if on the card they had a little Q code scanner so you could scan with your phone and then go right to their website. Even better. Even better. I think this is yeah. a great business idea. We're going to, we'll talk yes. about this. After. <laughs> I think that's a great idea, Jason. And now awesome. you've, we've just basically humanized the folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. that we're trying to promote. So, and Lynn, I, I know that you have a really unique perspective on um, kind of branding a practice in terms of, uh, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about, because you do the, the peak medical marketing company that you've started, you basically provide liaisons to help promote a practice. So depending upon the size of the practice, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and how, how that helps to build the brand for the organization. Exactly, and that's the whole the whole foundation of the, the, the company I started. So it's to bridge the gap between a primary care physician and the specialist, because as everyone knows, 20 years ago, hospitalists started in the hospitals. The back in the day when like Ron and I were injured, <laughs> our primary care doctor would see us in the hospital. But now it's just the specialists. So a lot of these incoming PCPs don't know Dr. Ron. Who is Dr. Ron? I see his name. I don't know what he does. And those baseball cards would be really good. Um, so the benefit is, is we have a representative that goes out on their behalf and educates the primary care physicians on surgeries they're doing, on new office locations, but they also build that relationship that we've been talking about. They begin to see Lynn as a rep, but I'm also my specialty. I'm their link. So they can share if they're having issues referring patients, what, you know, um, takes too long to get into it. Or one of their patients said, you know, I was treated really badly at the front desk. Well, we our representatives have the ability to share that with the practices. So it just builds that relation, community relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, at one of my previous practices, I used to visit more than 100 practices a couple of times a year. And, and building those relationships was very helpful when things went bad. Like if there was a patient who had a bad experience and I knew about it, I could call somebody that I knew in the practice and tell them in advance that, hey, listen, so-and-so was here. They had a bad experience. You might be hearing from them. I just wanted you to hear from us first. And they'd say, thank you very much. You know, or they might say, I've already heard about it. And that's not what they said happened. Thank you for calling. Cause now I think, <laughs> now I know you didn't pull a knife on my patient. I'm like, Oh, yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for, um, for sharing that. Um, I guess a, another open-ended question and, and um, I, I'm curious, I kind of know how important they are, but I, I'd like to maybe have somebody speak to how important online reviews are. Uh, for a practice and how important an online reputation is if, if uh, somebody wants to take a stab at that. I think it's very important. Um, yeah. Like I talked about that the patient, I'm coming out of seeing Dr. Ron, I get in my car and I was told by Dr. Ron to see Dr. Jason. So the first thing I do is get my phone out and I look up Dr. Jason. And if he has five reviews and the average review star is a three. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'm going to go to see Dr. Jason. And yeah. I'll go home and ask my friend, and who did you go to get your ACL repaired? And they'll be like, oh, well, I went to Concord Orthopedics. <laughs> and I had a great, had a <laughs> great time. The doctor was so kind, considerate, and I felt like I was welcomed there. Well, I'm not going to go see Dr. Jason because the reviews weren't there or the website didn't look good. Mm -hmm. Reviews mm -hmm. are so important yep. now. Yep. Even Absolutely. my mom goes on the phone and looks up reviews. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then, and then also the, the, just the importance of having, uh, 
healthy Google, Google My Business listings, I would encourage wow. everybody who's listening to make sure that they own them and that they control them and that they're, they have all the robust information. I don't know, I, I didn't wanna jump in front of Matt or Jason, I don't know if you guys had anything else on that before we move to our next topic. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, I, what Lynn said is perfect, but I think it's important that you, you're, you can't prevent negative reviews. You're, you're gonna get some negative reviews, but you have to pay attention to it. You have to address it. If you're gonna do marketing, it's gotta be a full-time thing. You have to watch it constantly. If, if somebody has a bad experience, you can recover with, um, with the reason. You, you, can, you can comment on their review and say, I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Um, we were under construction that day and that's why the sidewalk was the way it was or, or, or something like that. If you just leave it untouched, then it, then it is a negative review. But a negative review can be made positive if you address it. I think that's, I think that's super important to watch those things happen. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I, I'll just um, expound on that a little bit. Um, I feel like we're in a culture where whatever you do, you, you look online to see what it, what it is. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I just looked up like a yard cleaning service and <laughs> like, you know, all these repair people. And, and that, that speaks to me like, okay, you have, if you have one review and it's a five-star review, and, but if you, for, for me, maybe I'm just the weird one, but if you have 50 <laughs> reviews and you're a four star, I'm going there first. Yep. Um, so, and I, I see in the chat, somebody said that's where Raider has been very helpful. And, you know, I, I know Evan's on here and Ron, obviously you're at Raider right now. Um, that's where using those kind of services really helps boost whatever you need to, to do. And just a quick example, one of our providers had a really, really low health grade score for some reason. I mean, it was just like, for some reason it was low. And we worked with our with Raider Aid and our, our account manager there and we boosted up the health grade specifically for that provider. And he noticed, like he had patients come to him, tell him, it's like, oh, like, you know, I just, I saw your, your health grades was low. Now it's pretty high. I was like, I'm not sure what's going on, but I really like to see that score go up. And it's like, all your scores are very similar across all platforms, not just Google's up here and Raider in health grades are down below to have that kind of big cultural um, review. But, but also it's, it's a great way to start a conversation if like, you know, you go to say, hey, I'm, I'm, say your friend, hey, I saw J Dr. Jason and his reviews weren't that great, but what do you think? And if somebody can then back you up on the other side saying yes, good or bad, um, it's, it's, you have that more information to go in. So even if your review is low, but you have a good reputation otherwise, you can, kind of soften that negative review a little bit more, but but yeah, for sure. Those online reviews for anything you do, think about any restaurant you go to, what's the first thing you do? Um, even if you don't like Mexican food and you're going to a Mexican restaurant, you're gonna find out what the best dish there is and you're probably gonna get that one dish. Mm -hmm. True. Matt, uh, just in follow up, thank you for that. Uh, Jamie Richard had a question for, uh, for us while we were talking about um, what we would do with a review that was like six months old, like if there was a negative review that hadn't been addressed, like um, mm -hmm. I'm going to start calling him Dr. Jason, even though he has bad reviews. <laughs> <laughs> like Jason had a, had, a, had mentioned, like how, how would you handle that at Concord? Um, I would hope I would hope it didn't get to that point, and it wasn't six months in, into the the past. I mean, mm -hmm. if if you're going to get a review, and that that's that's huge. If somebody takes the time. And I think we all know that the majority of people are going to probably review your site or your service if it's a negative experience. Right mm -hmm. I mean, it, it takes, you know, I'm not sure what the numbers are, but it's exponentially greater to have a negative review than a positive review. So if you have that and you're letting it sit there and this fester, and that person can just then be talking to whoever they want to be like, I had this issue. I tried to reach out and they nobody said anything to me. Like that, that is just exponential negative reviews. But if you're able to, to combat it that day or the next day, either you know through that online review site or um, like giving them a call because you obviously have their information, then you can start building that trust back and say, like Jason said, oh, we had a, just a bad day or, or whatever. And we actually just had an experience like that. Um, we're partnering with a local hospital and some people up at that local hospital didn't quite understand about same day appointments. So they told our patient like, oh, we don't do that here. And this lady wrote this, I don't wanna say scathing review, but it was a negative review about, oh, <laughs> agoropedics does not 
you know, have the services that they say they do. I actually got on the phone with this lady, um, just telling her, you know, like what about the situation. She took the review down before I even could ask her if she would want to. And then she wrote a positive review saying everything was handled. I, I, and thanks so much for clearing things up. So that's the way to build that piece on. But um, as for a six month review, you would probably want to talk to your providers or your upper management to say, here's a problem that we had, but maybe can somebody reach out in the future? And this, these are issues that we might have. Uh, that's that, that's a great great answer, and I, I would just briefly add that I would encourage you to bury that bad review with really good reviews. <laughs> um, I, I would at least reply to it, um, even though it's six months old. I would reply to it today. I apologize for not getting back to them, and uh, and try to address whatever it is. I'm I'm an ultra sales guy, so I would I would be sick, sticky sweet about oh my god, I'm so sorry I didn't see this. And is there anything I can do to help? You know, I, I would still address it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's six months old, eight months old, a year old, I, I would still I would still jump on it. There are a couple of other questions coming through the chat, and I, and we will get to those. Um, I'm, I'm a, me, I'm going to ask you to take note of those questions for us. But I do want to um, shift gears, maybe change the subject a little bit, because earlier on, um, Matt had mentioned that we we're going to talk about social media. You also mentioned about attracting patients before they need you. Um, I'm assuming the answer to that riddle is through something like Facebook or, or through social media and building a relationship. So I'm going to direct it to you first, Matt, because um, I know you've had, you've had a lot of success in building up Facebook followers at Concord Orthopedics. So I'm curious about your strategy and what's worked, what hasn't worked. And, and how important you think it is? Um, yeah, I, I think it's super important. It's one of the most, for me, it's one of the most important things we do, um, especially now in the pandemic, which I, I'm not sure if there's an end to in sight right now, um, but especially now when people aren't doing as much, especially in the orthopedic world where reliance on people falling down, going skiing, being active, but when you have shutdowns, that is just naturally gonna slow down. Uh, and we've seen it as a practice that those, you know, big cases, total joints are slowing down because people are either afraid of COVID or they have lockdowns or they're not active as much as they usually are, right? So we've been able to revamp and just kind of reimagine what we do as a practice in marketing. Um, before it was just patients come to our door, we tell them what's going on, they leave, they come back for surgery. Now we're, we're doing a little bit more outreach and social media is the perfect way to do that because of course people who are home doing nothing are either watching Netflix or flipping through some kind of social media channel. And I, I think the numbers are like people spend two hours a day on like Facebook, which is bananas. Um, and I think people over the age of like 50 are spending over an hour and a half on Facebook, which is also bananas. Um, so you have a captive audience who's looking for something and why not take the advantage there and put your message to where they're looking? I mean, mm -hmm. as marketing, you're always kind of like, oh, do I put it on a billboard? Do I put it on the radio? Who's going to hear this? Now we have a very structured system where you can find kind of like any analytics you want, which is great for those ROI people who need to you know, justify the spend at some point. But you have a, a captive audience ready to do something. And as we all know, social media is pretty cheap too. So if, if that's part of your, your equation, whether or not you wanna spend money here or there, social media is a more probably dollar for dollar better spend than that $10,000 billboard that looks great because it's huge and gigantic and you have a million impressions a month, but who's really looking at that billboard? And if you can remember the last billboard you saw and what it said, I'd, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> Um, Lynn, you had a, a really good story that you shared with me about how um, how a practice went about increasing the number of followers they had. Uh, I was wondering oh, if you yeah. could share that. Yeah, I would definitely like to share that. And um, so a, a practice that I work with, they, I know you guys are probably Patriots fans, but they raffled off Eagle tickets <laughs> <laughs> and the engagement doubled to their Facebook account 
and it was just two Eagles tickets, but it, the people were looking at it. They were sharing it with their friends. So it was a great way to get the practice name out to their recipients or their patient base. And the numbers stayed up. They didn't stay quite as high, but they definitely stayed up pre-Eagles and the level has maintained uh, because we, they put out good content and they do weekly posts and they do physician features, which is really nice. And what I, they, what I also recommend my practices to do is definitely do the social media, the digital marketing, just targeted digital marketing has made a huge impact with one of my practices. So if they're focusing on Facebook, let's say they're focusing on hip arthritis, well, then they're, they coordinate the digital piece to target people who are going into the medical building, going into physical therapy with messages about the practice focusing on hip arthritis. And it's, it's kind of ties into what Matthew said. You're trying to hit them on the social and the media level because you know, they are at home doing that. So I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. Jason, what about you? Any, any um, um, nuggets of gold to share with us about social media? <laughs> I have millions of ideas. Uh, I'm a t-shirt guy. I, I love when I see uh, the ortho practices do t-shirts with their logos. Um, a buddy of mine who's in the, in the print media world, he says, Jay, you, orthopedics is cool. You're not urology. Like, that's not cool. You're, you're <laughs> orthopedics. Like, that's a cool thing. It's, it's broken it's not- bones. Yeah, it, it, you're in a cool business. He says, so you, you're x-ray. We, we sell x-ray to orthopedic surgeons. That's a, that's a, those are cool things. It's easy to do marketing when you're in a, a not a fun business, but a, but a unique business. Uh, uh, orthopedic sports medicine is a, is a cool thing. So there's a million ways to market that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, Matt was talking about uh, your presence and, and I, I go by some orthopedic practices and I look at their sign, right? If the sign in front of your building is falling down, that's a bad impression. The, the impression starts way before patients walk in the building. It's, it's important for your logo and your presence and your building and your parking lot. And, and if people drive by your practice and they see it and it looks like a nice place, then, then that, that's like Matt said, that's where the marketing starts. Then they become you, your friend on Facebook and they follow you and, and it goes from there. Uh, again, I'm a t-shirt guy. I like, I, I love to see the <laughs> orthopedic t-shirt logos and, uh, and people ask each other uh, when they see the t-shirt, oh, oh, did you go there? What'd you have done? Like it's a, it's a conversation starter at the gym or at a, mm-hmm. at a fun run or at an event where you see somebody with a t-shirt on when you're contemplating having a knee replacement, you know? No cotton just, though, right? Is that, is that just a bias I have or is that true? No I, cotton. It's whatever money you want to spend if you want to buy the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, Matt, I, I had a, a question uh, for you, kind of getting, getting back a little bit to the social media discussion, because I'm, I'm curious if you have some stories to share with um, unique physician engagement in social media and how it impacts um, patient response. Yeah, um, so we, we had a great story. Um, I hope you don't mind, Ron. Uh, it has to do with Ron a little bit. Oh. Um, that's not what I was thinking. Okay. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, so uh, back in the early pandemic, we had um, a shortage of patient screeners in one of our um, uh, one of our sites. Oh, yeah. And all of us in the leadership team kind of looking around and like, Who, who's going to do this? Nobody <laughs> really wants to do this. And, and Ron's like, I'll do it for a few hours. So uh, my, my, my mind exploded. I was like, wow, the CEO is going to go go screen patients and that's amazing. So he went down and I was like, make sure you get a photo of this. You need to take a photo so I can post <laughs> it on social media. Yeah. Because in my in my world, I'm like, this is gonna be the best thing in the history of the universe. Mm-hmm. Posted it up, it, it did pretty well. Um, I, I will say it did pretty well for a guy that probably nobody in our, pra- or in our patient base has ever seen before. Um, definitely not on our social media page they've really seen. It went viral Contra- as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> in, in contrast, um, 
a few months before we had um, one of our providers, um, we were changing, we were having a new office built and a, a different satellite office pre-pandemic. And he mm -hmm. was, somebody took a photo of him. I think it was kind of planned, but it was like, a, hey, take his photo real quick. And they sent it to me. And I posted that as well. And it was literally him sitting at a metal desk in a hallway, just smiling, <laughs> like just random, could have been anywhere. Um, and we're like, you know, whatever it takes, we're going to see your patients. And that thing just went ridiculous. I mean, probably eight times better review than, you know, than Ron, which I thought <laughs> was amazing. <laughs> so that's part of, it was part of two things that we kind of were enlightened to on that day is that what I think is good isn't necessarily always good. Um, and that's okay. Um, but then we're able to listen to our patient base and say, what does our following want to see? And what we found out is that, you know, we don't have LeBron James coming through Concord, New Hampshire all the time. <laughs> you know, you don't you have Michael Jordan doing those, those things and saying like, this is the best place ever. But who our influencers are, kind of getting back to those Bill's baseball cards and, and building the trust, our influencers are the people who are doing the surgeries and who've been here for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of tailored now everything that we do social media wise to a provider centric piece, because we know that having that provider giving the information, whatever it is, is more impactful than, than me or our CEO or, or just, you know, Joe Schmo or Dr. Jason, like those things, those providers, again, <laughs> who built the trust are, is just so much more important than anything that we really did I think previous to that one post. Um, so we were able to restructure what we do to base upon pretty much everything for that. Yeah, that's that, that's a great point. Um, one of the things I think that you, oh, go ahead, Jason. Uh, Matt, you made me think of something. Um, you know, we talk about what we think is gonna be good on Facebook, what we think people will like, and it doesn't always work the way we think. Uh, I remember having a conversation at my office uh, about guys, we do a lot of cool x-ray stuff, but if you post on our Facebook page, do you think the white cat or the black cat is cuter? We'll get more responses. People like to hear their opinion. They, 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 want, they want to feedback. So when we do things at our office and where we're thinking about how we're going to do things, we post it on Facebook and say, hey, what do you guys think? Should we do it this way or that way? And the feedback is tremendous. That People like to give their opinions. They like to for good or bad, they like to speak their mind and, and, and say what they want. So we've had a lot of success uh, with asking questions of our Facebook followers, and um, it's worked out well. Just a thought. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, you know, Matt, I was just going to throw it back to you one more time, because you did something at Concord Orthopedics that was, um, I think, something that everybody could learn, which is that you impressed upon the physicians that they might be doing something of interest that they should just take a picture and send it to you. And it, it, at first it wasn't received with, you know, oh yeah, I do a lot of things. I'm gonna send you a lot of pictures. It was kind of like, who, me? I mean, that was really the, the, the reaction from the physicians. They're like, are you talking, you're talking to me? Like if I'm, if I'm standing on the sidelines of a, of a sporting event covering a game, you want me to take a picture of that? Like, yes. Yes. Yep. So it That's took a while, didn't it? So, I mean, you can, I don't want to talk, you can talk about it. Yeah, it took maybe a few months to get it through them. And this is, again, part of the, I'm not sure if it's a, a global thing, but just at least for us, it's our physicians want the spotlight, but don't want the spotlight kind of situation. Yeah. Um, and, but they want to be spotlighted in the, the operating room. Um, but again, how do we make sure that our, our patient base feels that they're part of the community. So we did have one of our providers um, get a photo of him at like a local football game on a Friday night that he was covering. And he's like, are these photos okay? I'm like, yep, these are great. And they were awful photos, awful. Um, but they exploded. And because people are just like, oh, love, love Dr. So-and-so. This is the best, like this is so great to see him out there. And then we kind of doubled down through the pandemic. We asked our providers like, what are you doing this weekend? Like, and so we had a few providers, like one was baking cookies, one was playing piano with his daughter. So again, just those little moments that you can kind of say like, oh, I do that and that's normal. And again, a, just a different level of understanding of who our providers are 
versus just, oh, there's a doctor giving me the worst news ever. This is something else that, you know, is, is a conversation starter and that you can build a little bit more of a relationship with. Great, great. Um, any other social media topics we should be touching upon before I switch gears on you all again? This, I, this, I would say just last is engage. I think Jason, what you said is really important. Um, yeah. Either asking people questions, but if you have a great post um, and people are, are writing comments, if you have 40 comments on your post, that's fantastic. But if you engage with them and you say, yes. yeah, thanks so much, you know, Linda, that was, yeah, happy to do it for you or whatever the thing is, um, yeah. it, that goes a long way too to have a little bit of a, a conversation with your, your patients and saying like, if you do something here, you'll get a response. And that's really important for the user of the Facebook channel to say, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't just like, like it and people, you know, whatever. They actually meant something to that organization and they wrote back to me. That's really important. And it might take you 30 minutes one day, but that 30 minutes might be well worth it next yeah. year. Great. Powerful. Agree. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I apologize that I'm missing some questions as they come through, but uh, Renee Reynolds just posted a question about, about boosting posts yeah. and, and how impactful that can be, how often it's done. Um, floor is open. So we, we boost a post if it has some success. Um, you know, like Matt and I were just talking about, you never know when a post is going to grab attention. So if we post something and we start to see traffic from it, then we'll boost it. We'll make it bigger. If, if some people like it, a lot of people will like it. We, we, we kind of go on that theory. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't do it too much. I guess there's the question mark. You don't want to irritate your followers with too much data. You, you, you don't want to overdo it. Um, but I, I don't think anybody in the orthopedic world is in the uh, Geico marketing world where it's constant pounding. Um, I think any marketing is good at marketing. So, so we boost the things that look um, that we get some feedback from. That's when we trigger that thing. Okay. You know, for us, we, we boost anything that's kind of big and newsworthy. Yeah. So yeah. we'll have like, like, like a rel relatively weekly um, video of our providers giving like a, a small little tip of like, make sure you stand up every few hours when you're working from home. Like just little things, but we won't boost that. But when we opened our brand new orthopedic surgery center, you better believe we boosted the heck out of that before we posted it. We want yeah. the biggest reach imaginable for, for that $200 or whatever it was. And mm -hmm. you would be surprised at how much reach and, and engagement you get from a very, very lowly boosted post. Because once you build your base, that's just like an automatic you know, start block for you. But once you boost that just a little bit, and the best part about that is you can target it to wherever you want it to be targeted. Right. Um, so you can really get down to the nitty gritties of, oh, I want it to be boosted, but I want it to be boosted 50 miles away because that's where my nearest competitor is. You mm -hmm. know, so you can get into some minutia like that. But yeah, anything that we, we feel would be really important for our patients to know, we boost it, even if it's like 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the impact that $50 can have. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you do target it the way, way you mentioned it. And I think that transitions well into what I was hoping to speak about next, which is kind of um, the elusive subject of kind of defending our marketing efforts in terms of return on investment. So I think it's probably a great place to start when you boost a post, you're able to know exactly what the return on investment is. So I don't know if any of you can speak to that and, and what kind of data you get and um, what you learn from a boosted post. Sure, I guess, I guess I can go here. It might be easier for me. Uh, so when we boost a lot, uh, relatively a lot, but um, so that, then we're able to find out just the demographics. So that's huge. It's like, I, I want this post to be from 50 years up and that's it. I don't want teenagers seeing this thing because I mean, they're probably not gonna have any decision power anyway when they're coming to get their care. But we're able to really break it down and say, and what I find really good about boosting is a lot more people will comment on it. So people will say like, oh, like, oh, that's great. You have this new surgical center. My knee kind of hurts. Like, and then I'll be like, oh, give us a call right now. Come see, come see us for our acute injury clinic. And then I'll follow up with that though. 
So it's, it's a little bit more of a, a legwork for me, but if I can say I boosted something for 200 bucks and the next day we got a total knee replacement out of it, I think it's worth it. <laughs> um, <laughs> or at least for me, it's, it's worth that. That is worth the price, right? And then you get the, the next parts of that, that patient is like, was your experience great? And how does their recovery go? And you can kind of walk with them through their journey and say, hey, like, make sure you like us on Facebook or whatever the medium is. And when, if you follow their journey and then you once, then you see the post a year later, oh, so happy that I'm able to get back to picking up my grandkid. Thanks to mm -hmm. Conquer Orthopedics, they tagged you because now they followed you. You can then reply back, so great, Melissa. So happy this happened for you. Like we, we're, we're always here for you no matter what. We hope we never see you again. But the <laughs> ROI piece is really, really important because like in a traditional sense, I think for sales, like for, for someone like you, Jason, it might be easier. Like, okay, I went to this meeting. It cost me X amount of dollars to travel. It cost me lunch or whatever, but right. sold the machine or whatever it is. Right. So yep. oh, worked out well. But mm -hmm. for marketing for an orthopedic, which I think we mentioned before, like the sales cycle is so long. Like right. my capture of a sale might be long after I've been fired from this organization, but they don't realize that until that it happened in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So for executives who are on this call, it's important to understand that ROI is not always gonna be brought down into a physical number. It could be engagement of your patient. It could be trust of the patient. It could be a few more office visits. It could be just somebody else following your accounts, which is and then long-term marketing. And hopefully in a few years, because you've done that thing now, you capture that patient. But if you're only looking for, you posted something, how much did it cost? How many engagements were on that one thing? You might be gauging or, or valuing the wrong piece of that ROI. Very interesting. I, you know, you make a great point that return on investment is, is not always measured in dollars, right? It can be measured in how many people visit your Google My Business profile, right? If you're looking at your Google My Business Insights, it can be measured in how many people are visiting your website. So when you do an initiative, any type of marketing initiative, you can see if you're getting pe more people to both your pro the Google My Business profile or to your website, so paying attention to those numbers uh, is, is really important. Anything else on return on investment? It's, a, it's, it's sometimes a difficult question to answer, but I think sometimes social media gives you raw data that you can answer it with. And sometimes just volume of people visiting different sites um, can, can really provide you with a tool to say, this is, this is what we did and this was the impact of it, even if it's not measured in patients. There are some practices I can tell you that do a successful job of translating um, uh, a marketing effort to new patients being brought into the practice. So it's challenging, but it but it can be done. Uh, we're getting close to the end, and I, I know there's questions out there. Um, I, did anybody else have anything they wanted to add about return on investment before we might we might think about transitioning to questions? Okay, Mia, do you want to handle the questions for us? I've I've caught some of them as they've come as they've come through, but um, admittedly, I've lost some of them. There is a question Carrie Barber just asked, and then I'll turn it over to you, Mia, about how sign how significant is face to face marketing to referring offices? Very important. <laughs> yeah, like, and it's this is the thing that's going to probably take the most time, not a lot of money, but a lot of physical time just to drive to the place and to have the meeting, um, especially with COVID, like a lot of people aren't wanting just random people rolling through their office. But if you're able to make that face to face and say, hey, I'm gonna be the person you wanna talk to if this happens, or if you want me to bring some lunch over for your pro providers, I'd love to do that. Um, thanks for giving us 300 patients. I think it's worth a lunch for you guys. Um, so that, face-to-face -face so they can say, okay, Matt is the person I know over there. And if I ever need anything, I can call him whenever I need it. So it's, it's really, really um, important for, for us at Conquer Orthopedics. Yeah. I have some statistics that I used with the 
when I'm speaking with my clients. So for example, I was working with a practice and they were getting in around 110 new patients a month. And they implemented having a physician liaison go out and talk to the referral base. And after a whole month of that engagement to their referral base, their new patient referrals went up to 265 a month. So it's significant. I've had other practices just double. Um, it's, they want, your referral base want to know what you do. And they want to have a name, they want that baseball card <laughs> with right. the name and the face and, oh, he's a golfer too. Or mm -hmm. they just need that connection. So it's, mm -hmm. and it's a moderate, it's like Matt said, it's not a ton of money, but it's, uh, it's a great resource to keep in your back pocket. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I can tell you that um, what, what Lynn was saying earlier about physicians, not necessarily like a primary care physician, maybe not having the same relationship with a specialist that they had maybe a decade or more ago because of the, the existence of hospitalists now, that if you can get your one of your surgeons to visit a practice that you want to either, you know, say thank you to or build referrals with, they will so appreciate the fact that that person took their that their own time to come and meet with them, and 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 they showed up with pizzas, and they they taught us how to handle uh, something. They, you know, I can just tell a brief story. There was a, a pediatric practice that I was trying to increase referrals from for a long time. It took a long time to get through the door. I finally got through the door, and then I ultimately had all of their nurses come over to our orthopedic practice and learn about bracing and splinting, how to handle an acute injury. And, and, and immediately when the nurses came over and they met our staff and they were all, all of a sudden there was this relationship and it all just took care of itself. So um, there's a lot of opportunities there. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to steal the floor. Any, anything else on that before I turn it over to Mia for an, another question? Mia, we have anything out there? Cindy Barkowiak asks, do any of you do radio or TV ads? And does it create real benefit long-term? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, uh, I, I came into my practice pretty much saying I will never do radio, which makes probably you're assuming that we're gonna go into radio now um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> But again, I think that's part of the, the evolution of what you're doing and the times that we're in and to always be flexible with what your plan is. Like you can build out a marketing strategy. And I mean, if, if I told the CEO in 2019, this is what the marketing strategy for 2020 is going to be. Mm -hmm. I think things changed in 2020. Um, <laughs> so again, like how do you capture your audience where they are now? Um, is it social? Um, where we're looking into something like a like a public radio situation um, just because it covers the entire state the demographics are we're exactly what we're telling ourselves we want um, and this is the conversation we had though was what's the ROI and it's always difficult to tell the up higher ups what ROI on radio is mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you what it is they probably couldn't tell they could try to tell you what it is but they don't know what it is and it's the same with TV um, but if you can build that long-term build and that long-term burn of your, of your message and, and of your, your product and your brand, it's worth it for like a $7,000 spend over six months when you can do in other silly things here and there for a thousand bucks and they don't have any impact. But if you're willing to be able to take the risk of a $7,000 spend and then see where it goes from there, it's, um, it's something that you might want to take a peek at. I work with a practice here in Delaware that is on the radio. They coordinate their radio with digital and they do commercials during the University of Delaware football games, basketball games. And they are known from the top of the state to the bottom of the state just because they're on the radio. And one of the physicians, which may be one of you, your physicians in your groups, would want to commentate on some of the games. We have a fabulous doctor here who is involved. He stands on the sidelines, he commentates, he does the injury report. And that just helps build your brand. 
So that's something I would highly recommend. What do we got, Mia? Anything else? Thanks, Ron. I, Jamie Richard asks your thoughts on short YouTube videos of surgeons and patient testimonials to drive traffic and awareness. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in if you want. We got a, um, I got a guy up here in Boston that just opened up a uh, ortho laser thing, breaking away from his ortho practice and doing a laser thing. He's from San Diego, California. He, you would think he's an actor if you saw him. <laughs> and every day he's got some YouTube video or quick thing, uh, some new product he's trying. He gets Stryker and Zimmer and those, those young energetic guys involved. And hey, we're going to try this new thing today and check this out. And uh, he does cadaver lab videos. You can't buy guys like that, though. He's just <laughs> naturally, he wants to be in front of the camera. He's, he's got his phone in his hand all the time, you know, FaceTime this, FaceTime that. And he kills it. He's got millions of followers. He's got a YouTube channel. Um, he's just an amazing guy. He's, uh, he's an actor that's also a doctor. It's, it's, uh, you can't, I don't know how you create that. I don't know how you build that. Maybe there's somebody in your practice that wants to carry that torch. Um, but I, I want to tie that into another question that came up that Facebook and YouTube and these things, they're all free. You can put YouTube videos of your doctors up for free. You know, there's no charge for that. It's just your, your personal time and your attention to it. If you want to boost posts and do radio things, that's good too. Um, but marketing can be free. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It's just, uh, just time and energy. And you link your videos from your free YouTube channel yeah. from Amazing. your Facebook posts. Yeah. Amazing. And then it yeah. drives traffic to your website. So it completes yeah. the circle. <laughs> yep. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I know one, the practice I used to manage, I used to um, interview the physicians and do a podcast about the different surgeries yep. they did so yep. that yep. if somebody was having a total knee replacement, they could go to the website and listen to that doctor talking about it because in the office they heard, they learned a lot, but then they also forgot a lot. So they go back and relearn it a little bit. So that becomes yep. content that can be um, important too. Just a, a funny aside is that those um, podcast took on a much broader audience. I got a call from a doctor in Texas once who wanted me to be on my radio program. And I said, like, I don't have a radio program. But... <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what, what else do we have? So Brad Rhea would like to know if you have any experience with online newsletters and blogs. Mm -hmm. It's great. I know it's great content. It's very helpful with search engine optimization. Um, I don't know if we, anybody else did. I have a group that is creating a blog post to, and we just, you link it, right? They have a page, but it gets linked right to their website. But then when a, log, uh, a blog gets uploaded, say it's on a Monday, you shoot a Facebook post linking to the blog, which then drives traffic to your website. So that's the benefit of a blog. Um, it ideally it would be from the physicians. So uh, that if you've got one or two guys that enjoy blogging, I would do it at least once a month. So therefore your, your patients will begin to expect it. It's like, oh, we're gonna have Dr. Jason's blogs coming up this month. So that's the, the benefit of it. Great. Thank you, Lynn. I think we have Time for one last question or rather, rather comment from Miranda Madar. Expecting an ROI across all tactics individually is a bad precedent to set. All tactics need to work together to deliver on overall investment. Any comments? Good point. Agree. I agree. Speaking, she's yeah. speaking from experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, well said. I think um, one thing I, I want to mention, co-marketing, talk about um, if Concord Orthopedics and Associated X-Ray market together, we share both of our pools. We, we grow together. Your, your customers become mine and vice versa. Um, if you can do that um, with, your, with your sales reps, with, your, with other people, um, it can help. It can help uh, drive traffic back and forth. Co-marketing is a, a powerful thing. 
Great. Well, um, I think this has been a, a great event. I think a great, um, great panel today. Thank you so much. And Lynn, thanks for filling in last minute. Didn't show a bit. You were, you were a pro. Thanks. It's like you've been preparing for weeks. So I, I, I appreciate uh, everybody being on here. Uh, we are available afterwards as well. So I would uh, encourage you maybe to connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, that way you can, if you have any other questions ever, feel, you can feel free to reach out to us and uh, happy to help you however we can.